this week in the homework, it says that any points that you get will just be bonus points. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's all our plan to distress the poor graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, everybody's stressed, including even me. Today, we have a guest lecture. It's Professor Sara Sola from Northwestern University. She was trained as a physicist. Her PhD is in statistical physics. But early in her physics career, she did a few other things. She did a, you know, one of the important papers on crack propagation that's cited in geophysics a lot. And then she decided that neural networks are very interesting and brain so she switched to computational neuroscience and is today one of the leading people in computational neuroscience. And her role in medical community, she works with people who do uh, experiments in neurophysiology. And her role is to uh, do mathematics for, for them uh, and, you know, and it's been a very fruitful collaboration. So it's a very good example of how you combine physics training, mathematical methods with uh, a subject that's infinitely more interesting than physics today, which is brain science. There are two Saras and we are alone. So you're all first year graduate students, mostly? Uh, yes, all, yeah. all four of us now. Andrew is also first year graduate Andrew. student. Okay. Yeah, I have I have a lot of questions. Um, Great. If I can remember them all. Um, first of all, let me just ask you: uh, Do you have your uh, your background education uh, is in physics, mathematics, uh, neuroscience? In physics, I'm a theoretical physicist. Um, I think I, I I am a theoretical physicist. I did my PhD in phase transition in statistical physics, phase transitions, renormalization group, critical phenomena. And then when I was doing my postdoc, which was a kind of a statistical physics, solid state physics postdoc at Cornell with Neil Ashcroft, I heard John Hoffman give a talk about neural networks. This was the beginning of the neural networks. And I was totally in love with it because here was something that um, had some of the mathematics that I knew from spin glass models, but it was using the context of how to implant memory, how to acquire memories in the brain and how to retrieve them. And I was just totally fascinated that one could use these mathematical ideas to do something totally different. And I really decided to, to go in that direction. So I did a brief postdoc at IBM, and then I got a job at Bell Labs. At that time, Bell Labs was creating a neural networks group, and I was part of, a, you know, now there is all this brouhaha about deep learning is such a big thing, but but the original work was done. Uh, actually, I worked with Yande Kuhn and Joshua Benjo and all these guys. We were all in the same group. But um, we were trying to create neural networks for, for image processing and pattern recognition and, and speech recognition. And so we started a seminar where we invited neuroscientists because we thought maybe we can learn from how does the brain do it from the early stages of sensory processing, visual and auditory processing in the brain. Maybe we can learn about components that we should incorporate in our neural networks. But then when we started doing that, I became enamored for the second time in my career of now the brain, how the brain works. And so I moved to Northwestern and I've been at Northwestern for many years now, collaborating with real neuroscientists. So now I describe myself as a computational neuroscientist, a theoretical neuroscientist. I don't do experiments. I collaborate with people who do experiments, but I do this kind of of model-based data analysis as opposed to statistical data analysis. You know, the statistical packages give you tools and they don't care whether the data is financial data or neural data, they just give you tools. But then you throw away all that you know about the system. You know so much about the system, right? By, um, by the time you get the data, it's silly not to create models that incorporate that. And I think that being a, a physicist is a great education because it doesn't matter what you do next. It, it gives you a lot of mathematical tools. You're not afraid of mathematics. You're not afraid of thinking abstractly. And you, you just, you know, you can do anything you want, really. 
there was a time when I was finishing my career that was a very bad time for jobs in physics, and many of my colleagues went into finance. And all this idea of the quants in Wall Street, the guys who wrote the programs to, to, for the futures of the leave, they were all my colleagues, they were all physicists, you know, and they made a killing in Wall Street. Then you can reach. And, uh, so um, the point is that it gives you a way of thinking that allows you to solve problems in a quantitative way. You're not afraid of mathematics. You're capable of abstract thinking. I'm a great proponent of, of uh, a physics education, really, because it's an education. It's not, um, it's not a profession. It's an education, really. You, you come out of school with a toolbox, and the richer your toolbox, the larger, uh, the more interesting are the problems you can approach. And I think that physics gives you a very broad and solid toolbox. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for the response. Um, and another question I had is, obviously, we talk about uh, the reductions, dimensional reduction, and using those uh, two methods of um, you giving the distance between the, the points, um, and then you do the S, uh, single value decomposition to uh, reconstruct um, the matrix X. And then I think you mentioned the cost function over there. So my question, obviously, you mentioned uh, three neurons or three dimensions, but uh, real data have, uh, as you mentioned, many uh, degrees of freedom and many dimensions. So basically, the, after we're doing, let's say, we're doing the reduction of the noise, um, which there's another question about that, if uh, the neurons in the brain actually have noise or this is just from the measurement. Uh, but after you do this uh, reduction of the, the K elements, um, do, do, you, do you reduce uh, the dimensionality only by one, meaning when you're saying you have those uh, N dimensions? and then you just reduce it by one, or you reduce it further into actual two-dimensional manifold? Uh, no, we, we, we stayed with the, with the two dimensions, but the point is, I, I mean, if you're interested in this, you should really take a look at the, the science paper by Tenenbaum that I had on my slide. It's a paper from 1990, because he applies the method to, to pictures of a of a face, and these pictures are taken under different conditions of illumination and different pulses, like I'm looking like this, like this, like this, like this, you know. And you're supposed, so, you know, but the, these are images, these are like uh, 1024 by 24 images. So every face is a point in a very, very high dimensional space, in a one million dimensional space. Now, these are all faces of the same person. So he finds a two-dimensional manifold in which all these faces can be projected. And then this manifold has two axes, which are directions in the original space. They are not pixels, right? And one of the axes, what is changing is the pose from in the horizontal plane. And the other axis, what is changing is the pose along a vertical direction. And the algorithm finds it. It's not you knowing a priori. So people have done this to find now you do it across faces. Now, it won't be two-dimensional. You, maybe you need 40 dimensions, but it's still much less than the pixel space that you started out with. And now you'll find a low-dimensional representation in which faces cluster. And do they class, does this clustering correspond to specific individuals? Can you do person, rec person recognition by looking at this? Uh, at this low dimensional representation. So the low dimensional representation might not be so low as the ones I showed you. I showed you neurons that are all identical, pyramidal neurons doing the same area of cortex, ex executing the most stupid of tasks, which is just, you know, eight targets. So this, I get a low dimensional because the task is very non-complex. Even in motor cortex, there are manifolds that are higher dimensional than two. They are 10 or 15 if the motor task that you're executing is more complicated. You know, I, I don't know what it is when you play a piano sonata, but I cannot imagine. It's certainly not two-dimensional, right? Right, right? So um, it's, it's a measure of the complexity of the task, of the complexity of the, of the data set that you are analyzing. But the point is, once you go to the low-dimensional representation, you can find relations and clusterings and, and a way to analyze the data that you couldn't possibly see in the very high-dimensional space. In the very high-dimensional space, you're killed by sampling. How are you going to sample? a one million dimensional space in a way that is meaningful. How many samples do you need to make it meaningful? So you have, oh, I have, you know, I, I work for Facebook and I have a huge database. Yes, but these are points in a one million dimensional space. 
you're still doing a sparse coloring, a very dramatic subsampling. But now you're in a 40 dimensional space where you're putting these faces and you have a million faces. Well, now you're in business. Okay. So That's it's in, in all sorts of in engineering methods and, and computer science problems. This question of dimensionality reduction is, arises and it's very helpful. So dimensionality reduction is equivalent to um, the projection operator in which we project those high exactly, high exactly. On the exactly. So if you're pro if you're doing it in a hyperplane, PCA keeping k is equivalent to projecting in that k-dimensional hyperplane. So if you if you uh, now you remember that you reduce to the origin, so you're in the center of mass description. So you're in the center of mass description, and there you have created a k-dimensional hyperplane in which all the data has can be projected. So you still need, if you want to know the original data, you still need to know the vector from the origin to the center of mass, to know where the data was in real space. No? You need to add that. But it's exactly a projection operator. This is why it's all linear. PCA is linear. And isomap is doing the same, but projecting on the, on the curve manifold. It's neglecting by, by following these trajectories on the manifold is neglecting fluctuations that would take you away from the manifold, which brings us back to Andrew's question, is it valid to neglect those fluctuations just because they are low variance? And, and you always had to check that, whether that made sense for your problem. Um, do, do you think the noise you were mentioning, is that inherited uh, for the measurement operator of the neurons, or is that uh, Well, that... neurons are noisy. Neurons. Uh, fire when they are, they, ha they have an internal uh, potential which is negative relative to the, um, to the extracellular medium. The, and there's a lipid membrane that maintains the potential difference. And when ions, when ion channels open and positive ions, sodium anions come into the neuron, then the neuron brings the actual potential up, crosses that threshold and makes, brings the internal uh, membrane potential up, crosses the threshold, and emits an action potential. But that process of opening and closing ion channels is a stochastic process. So it's not a deterministic process that allows sodium ions from the extracellular medium to come into the neuron and make it fire. So the firing of the neuron is an, is an essentially intrinsically non-deterministic process. And then this action potential travels on the axon and talks to the neurons that are downstream from the one that made the action potential through synapses. And the synapses also have to do with opening of vesicles that release neurotransmitters, and that's also a stochastic process. So the noise is not just your measurement. In the case of the neural systems, there are intrinsic sources of noise. Uh, I actually do have a question that's related to something that you talked about at the end of uh your reply to Barr's last question. So um, you talked about how the, whether the low dimensional clustering could be used for identification purposes, right? And I, I had a question about um, something related to that, which is how do these, uh, how, how does the data actually evolve with time? So let's say you, you, know, you, you did a longitudinal study where you tracked the development of someone's brain and you did this kind of experiment uh, at time t, and then you, you brought them back into the lab later and did it at a later time, how could you identify what changed between the two data sets, and how do you compare that? And can you use that to identify? Andrew, Andrew you asked such a good question. We just had a nature neuroscience paper early this year that addresses exactly that. So. Um, Let's say there is a skill that you, you're an athlete or you're a musician. There is a motor skill that you practice all the time. Like these monkeys practice this eight center out task all the time when they come to the lab. So a manifold associated with that task forms is acquired. There is a manifold associated with that task. Once you have that manifold, every time you go back to that task, you go back to that manifold. This is what is called a learned skill. And when you're a musician or an athlete, you keep on practicing. And why do you keep on practicing? You think it's because you, you keep on practicing to maintain your muscle memory of how to. I mean, if you look like a, a great tennis player like Nadal, or 
this guy always serve. You, you watch him serve. He always serves in exactly the same way. He has a, a completely stereotypical way of serving. So there has to be a completely stereotypical neural activity that is guiding the plant, which is the muscles, to serve in this very stereotypical way. So what is maintaining that stereotypical neural activity? It's the preservation of the associated manifold. So you practice, you think it's to maintain your muscle memory, but I think you practice to reinforce the, the connectivity changes to, to stabilize the connectivity that gives rise to that manifold. And now I'm going to speculate because now I'm going to tell you something which is how I think of motor cortex, but not something that has been proved. So I believe that in your motor cortex, which is this million dimensional neural space, there are manifolds. And the manifolds are low dimensional. They are maybe five, they are 10, they are 40 dimensional. They are a little bit wiggly, not very wiggly, but a little bit wiggly. And they are task specific. So every time you learn a motor task, you form one of these manifolds. And then when you go back to that task, you go back to that manifold. You go back to a bicycle. You haven't ridden the bicycle in 10 years. You go back to a bicycle and you know how to do it. And you think it's muscle memory, but it's not muscle memory. It's neural memory. Your brain, your motor cortex know how to produce the patterns. Motor cortex is two synapses away from your muscles. Motor cortex connects to neurons in your spinal cord that connects to your muscles. So it's really the output of the brain. So what is stable in motor cortex is going to be stable in the muscles. So um, what changes point. will you see? The learned task will be stable, but hopefully there will be new manifolds because hopefully in the intervening time, you learn some new things. And every time you learn a new thing, you have to create a corresponding manifold. So there is a constant process of learning new things and preserving the things that you have learned. So you have to preserve the stability of the existing manifolds by practicing, and you have to have room to create new manifolds. But this is the beauty of these wiggly, low-dimensional surfaces. How many wiggly, 10-dimensional things can you put in a 1 million-dimensional space? You don't run into a capacity problem. These, these manifolds don't interfere with each other. That's also the, the beauty of these low-dimensional representations. Okay. You know, if in, a, in an n-dimensional space, if you put n-dimensional vectors, at some point they start being not linearly independent, right? But if they are not n-dimensional, they are really k-dimensional, where k is much smaller than n, because they are living in a k-dimensional subspace, then one subspace doesn't have to interfere with the other one. Right, okay. Yeah, that's something you mentioned that, that uh, was good to remind myself, actually, that the manifold that we talked about with this experiment appeared in the context of doing the eight dots pointing task, right? So that right. was a very specific task that led to a very specific clustering, we think. And so if you did a different task, you do a different clustering. Exactly. Okay. And then I guess I have a, the other part of my question is, a, is kind of a more a mathematical question, I guess, which is every time you do the experiment, you have like a different basis, right? Because you find different neural modes. So how yeah. do you compare the two different bases, right? This is great. So we have, um, we find different neural modes actually because with time, we are not even measuring the same neurons. We have a monkey that we have measured over more than two years doing this task. And then for the reasons that we discussed earlier about the electrodes, some of the electrodes might not be recording anymore. Some electrodes might have gone down a little bit and captured a new neuron that was there. So my sampling of the neural space changes. So certainly I'm not going to be in the same subspace. But, but because there is in the brain, there is a, a, a mother manifold, which is not the one we are seeing. We are seeing the mother manifold projected in the space, in the empirical neural space that we are measuring, which is only 100 neurons. But in the 10 to the 6 dimensional space of all neurons that participate in the task, there is a mother manifold. And maybe that one is 20 dimensional. I don't know. Maybe it is two dimensional. I don't know the mother manifold. But the mother manifold gets projected onto the neural space that I have access to today, the empirical neural space that I'm measuring today, according to where my electrodes are. And they give me a manifold. 
And on a different day, they give me another manifold. And I say, oh, how can I say that the dynamics is the same? Well, it turns out you can align them. And it's again a, a, a linear method called canonical correlation analysis that allows me to align manifolds corresponding to different days and show that actually the neural representation was totally stable. It's the same dynamics that is just being projected onto different spaces, but it's being projected just because of the way I'm measuring. In the real brain of the real animal, it's not being projected onto any, it's being projected into a manifold which is stable, and the dynamics mm -hmm. in that manifold are stable. I see. I imagine that would be more of an issue for, let's say, young minds, like let's say children whose brains develop change basically overnight, right? Right. So, the, the, so the, 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 this is why when you see when you see kids, even when they play, they repeat everything thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and this repetition has to do with the stabilization of the manifolds. It's, it's not like I learned it and that's it. I don't need to do it again. They, re, they do the same things over and over again, the same movements. They play with the toys. They construct the same towers. Or they sing a song and they say again, and you sing it again. And then they say again, and you sing it again. And the 40th time, you want to really <laughs> go to bed. But they say, oh, sing it to me again. Why? You know, it's, it's creating these representations and stabilizing them. And so this learning has a lot to do with repetition at the beginning. Mm, OK. Now, okay. if I told the, the monkeys execute different tasks, you know, like they put a ball on the top of a tube and they grab it and they put it back in. So that manifold is not the same as this manifold that I told you about. We can find that manifold and it's not the same manifold. So they are really task specific manifolds. And when the tasks are dissimilar, they have very different orientations. And when the tasks are a little bit similar, then the angle between these hyperplanes, the, there are some angles that decrease. So some of the neural modes are a little bit similar, which also tells you about facilitation of learning. Maybe if I'm going to learn something that requires a neural mode that I have already acquired, then maybe I can learning more easily than if I have to learn something that is very different from anything that I have learned before. Hmm. I know that there, that makes me think, actually, I'm going a bit long, but uh, maybe, maybe Bar can go next. But I wanted to just mention, because I, it reminded me of those like brain training apps that people talk about, like, oh, you yeah. can like, make yourself yes. sharper, smarter, whatever we're doing these every day. Yeah, by doing actually, something. You get better at doing the specific tasks in the apps, the not general sort of like. Of course, idea. of course, they are reinforcing that manifold. They are not making you smarter. Okay. Yeah. Because we don't so even know what smart point. is. <laughs> if we, if I ask you, okay, I want to implant an electrode somewhere to make you smarter. We, we don't know what smart is, so we don't know which area of the brain I would need to modify. But you can certainly get better at in, in a specific in a task specific manner. Thank you. It's like doing math. You get better by doing it. So, Adam, Sarah, any, Adam, Sarah, any questions? We didn't give you much time to ask questions. No, Bar and Andrew are um, much better at asking questions than I am. I, <laughs> I try and learn from them every day. Yeah, you know, I always find that when I ask a question, I'm not shy because I think I'm sure there were other people in the audience that were asking themselves the same question but didn't ask it. So you always learn for the questions that other people ask. But you have to learn to ask questions for yourself also. You're first year, so it's okay. But you have to learn to do that slowly. A lot of this like neural stuff freaks me out. So I'm, I try not to think <laughs> about it too hard. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. It's just no, putting okay. electrodes on people. Putting electrodes on people is a little bit uh, strange. I didn't show you, but we have data um, from taking at Brown University. This is a patient who was waiting for epileptic surgery, and therefore there was a, an, an opening in the in the skull. Um, they wait for until you have an epileptic seizure and then they, they identify the locus and they do that. And so he agreed to have an electron implanted and do the center out task. So we have the center out task uh, data from humans. And then talking about alignment, which is 
what Andrew was asking, we can align neural data from monkeys to neural data of humans. It is very, very simple, very simple, very trivial task. That, uh, so it's interesting how you can learn about one species by looking at the other. So, you know, I, I'm just guessing what Sarah is thinking. I might be wrong, but Professor Sola, do you ever think about the ethical implications of neuroscience research? You know, it's very powerful, advances are amazing. But... No, it's, it's, you know, lots of things are done in vitro, but then you need to go in vivo. You need to test in animals and eventually go to people, like drugs, you know, like we don't put drugs. So it's like you asked, um, okay, these vaccines that are being tested now for for humans, they were first tested in monkeys. Uh, so, is this ethical or not? It's the same. It's the same question. Uh, they are very. They are very um, strict regulations in place. Actually, they are stricter, regrettably, in some places in Europe than they are here. They should be even stricter in the U.S. than they are. And they are, when you are going to do an experiment that involves monkeys, you are always asked to to really justify. Why are you doing this experiment? What do you expect to learn? Uh, are you sure you cannot learn it in any other way? It's a, it's a, look, I'm sure a hundred years from now we will look back and we will think this was totally barbarian. I'm sure. I mean, I have no doubt that if we had other tools to do this would be totally unacceptable. But uh, right now we don't have other tools and we, we try to stay alive. So, um, you know, everything, uh, the work that I do, for instance, with these motor people has to do with extracting, how to extract from the motor cortex signals that can be used to guide prosthetic arms. Right now, if you have a prosthetic arm, you guide your prosthetic arm by, by using some residual movement in your shoulder, but it's totally unnatural. You're moving your shoulder in, in unnatural ways to tell the prosthetic arm to go and, and grab a cup of coffee and bring it to your mouth and, you know, do this and do that. But if you can um, extract these neural signals from motor cortex in, an, in a less invasive manner, and you can then decode those signals, like know the intent of motion, I meant to move to the right, I meant to move to the left, I meant to reach the glass, I meant to grasp it. Um, then you can use that to guide prosthetic arms. And um, we also do studies of how the, these neurons activate muscles. So if, we, if I learn the vocabulary, as I told you, these neurons talk almost directly to muscles. So if I know the vocabulary of the neurons and the vocabulary of the muscles, I can then stimulate the muscles using the right activation patterns, even if the activation is not coming from neurons. So if you have a spinal cord injury and you are semi-paralyzed below the waist or below the neck, we can activate your muscles so that your arm does the movement that you want to do. So, you know, these are not um, frivolous. These are not frivolous goals. These are not, oh, because I want to learn more about the brain, I, I, I torture little animals. It's... Um, it, it, a lot of this research has very important clinical implications, and I think that's the justification that is mostly used. But again, you know, I um, it's uh, not everybody likes to do monkey work. Not everybody wants to do monkey work, and some people try it and, and move away from it. Um, uh, it's not for them, and they go to areas of neuroscience that are more cellular, molecular, where you do experiments more like in a biochemistry lab, but they don't involve animals. So it's it's, it's not a it's not a simple question to answer. Um, I would like to ask uh, to touch on uh, Pedro the question, and obviously this is a fascinating field, and I, I wanted to ask a few questions about the progress of the field. So, how much have we learned more about and discovered about the brain um, in the past, I don't know, 10, 20 years? And like, how, how many new discoveries are there? And yeah. Yeah, a lot. It's a very exciting field to work on from the science point of view because um, there's so much progress in, in the experimental techniques, the things that we have access to. So. Uh, a big window was opened by what people call optogenetics. And optogenetics is as follows. You um, 
this is mostly done on, on rodents, on mice, which people have an easier time working with than with monkeys. It seems that there are so many mice around that people don't particularly like them. So it's okay to, to have rodent labs. It's easier than having, justify having monkey labs. So what you can do is you do genetic manipulations and there are, there are many different types of neurons in the brain. So let's say you identify a specific type of neurons, let's say neurons in your, I'm going to throw a couple of technical terms, in your basal ganglia that express D1 dopamine receptors. And this, you, you manipulate genetically the animals so that these neurons now express something that is called channel rhodopsin. Channel rhodopsin is a molecule that is sensitive to light. So now when these animals are doing, running around the maze and you shine light on them, you activate only those neurons among the, the thousand different types of neurons that are in the brain. So now you can study the behavioral consequences of activating those neurons. Does the, man, does the animal do things that it couldn't do before or stop being able to do things that it was able to do before? So if you, if you Google um, optogenetics, which is this combination of optical stimulation with genetic manipulation, I mean, you will find tens of thousands of papers because the goal is to really come close to understanding behavior. I mean, I, a lot of people who do more molecular or, or neuroscience, you know, they study one particular type of neuron, they put it under the microscope and they study the, how the ion channels open and close. But it's very hard to make a causal relationship from that to behavior because, but then if you can manipulate a neuron in vivo in a behaving animal, then you can begin to establish that kind of causality. Because eventually we really want to understand behavior. That's the goal, right? We want to understand decision making. We want to understand motor control. We want to understand language acquisition. Those are the things we want to understand. So it's an exciting field to be in because the progress is amazing and it's, it's a driven by experiment field. So the progress always comes from some brilliant person or brilliant group of people is never a person you know it's always it's science so it's always a collective effort um having an idea and developing it and, and uh, putting it forward and, uh, and and then it opens a completely new way of thinking because you, you can do experiments that you could would only speculate about before and the other big uh, area of progress is in, in mapping the brain is in uh, studying the different types of neurons and how they are connected. There is this effort called the connectome, which is to can we understand how the brain is wired? And um, and again, you know, the reason for it was not so difficult for me to move into this field is because statistical physics gives you the tool to understand the collective properties of systems composed of relatively simple elements. So each element is a little bit uh, silly, can do only a few things, but now you interconnect them in the network and the collective behavior of the network is interesting. And that is exactly what neurons do. You know, every neuron can do only a few things, but you interconnect them into a network of neurons and then you get a very powerful brain. So um, all the techniques that allow us to study networks and to allow us to study behavior, as in these recent techniques of the genetics and the connectome, uh, they open the door to, it's, it's a fantastic field to be in right now, really. One of the one of the things I'm interested in and also really scared of is uh, like it's scary. It's scary to, because yeah, the ability to simulate experiences, like for example, in virtual reality, right? So like you know, there's the idea of like smell o vision. There's the idea of yeah. like perfect simulation of reality in your mind, right? And so if you yeah. imagine we once one day get to a point where we know so much about how the brain works and how to generate experiences, not just how to recognize experiences, yeah. Yeah. then well, we could do anything. Like, I mean, you know. Yeah, but you know, everything, I think it's very interesting how we, we worry about these catastrophic uh, consequences, and we should, because we do things that have catastrophic consequences. You know, we exploit, we explode nuclear bombs and we threw plastics in the ocean. So we do mindless things that have catastrophic consequences. So we should always worry about that. But on the other hand, 
biology is it's too complicated for us to be able to do that so you and, and now i'm going to talk about something which is not my field i read about it in the newspaper same as you do but there are all these crisp techniques for editing genes and then people say oh then you can have designer babies because if we do an in vitro fertilization then we go and edit those genes and then you have a smart baby or you have a baby with blue eyes and then we implant the edited uh, fertilized egg and it's like a designer baby so people who are very rich and can do this will be able to specify the kind of baby they want to have isn't that very worrisome well it turns out it is very worrisome but it turns out that crisp is now showing that when you edit the genes that you wanted to edit you also it also has consequences on other genes that you were not able to predict so maybe your baby will i mean i mean to go a bit crude but maybe your baby will have blue eyes but will be schizophrenic so that wasn't such a great deal was it so uh, you know i think that nature has a way of of and maybe nature will get rid of us just to protect itself you know that's also possible <laughs> because so i i somehow find that the our knowledge is so imperfect and nature is so complex and robust that i don't tend to worry too much about our ability to do this uh, this thing but it is a concern they are worrisome i agree with you they are worrisome possibilities we should not uh, you like that pizza and beer idea. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, buzz about uh, one of my uh, childhood heroes, uh, probably Elon Musk and his new company, um, Neuralink. So he is obviously um, a dreamer and entrepreneur who tried to push this idea further. And I believe he did some kind of a, um, animal trial in pigs and he were able to have this uh, wireless transmission of chips of uh, information from the pig's brain um, to the computer. So obviously yeah. he's trying to enable humans to communicate directly uh, with uh, machines and with computers. Um, obviously it touches upon the point of predrug and uh, the regulation and humanities. But how far do you think we can take it, and will we be able to see this kind of interaction? Um, within our lifetime, as if I'm going to wake up and just by thinking I can turn on the light and control um, the dishwasher and yeah. just text other people with my brain. First of all, you can have an Alexa now and you can tell Alexa turn on the dishwasher, right? So uh, the technology is there. I just need to get that information out of you. And whether that get information out of you by you speaking it or by you thinking it, has to do with being able to extract information from your brain. So when I said I can, I can guide a prosthetic arm, we do this wireless transmission for a couple of years now. So we just use it to extract information, not about speech, because these are, these are monkeys, but we use it to extract information about intent of motion. Again, with the idea of doing prosthetics and, and rehabilitation of, of quadriplegic patients. But imagine that you're a patient who has ALS and you're locked in, you cannot speak. But if you had the motor control to, 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 ta to control um, a keyboard, then you would be able to communicate, right? You would be able to send the cursor to the letters and it would be slow, but you would be able to communicate. So um, all behavior eventually is about motor control, you know, controlling your speaking plant or, or reaching for a keyboard or... What about uh, thoughts and ideas and memory? Yeah, thoughts, that, I think that's much harder because we don't know what is a representation of those thoughts. So, uh, so my problem with, uh, with Musk on this particular, uh, is that he made a lot of, he gave a lot of publicity to something with this press conference and the pigs, which is something that neuroscientists do. I mean, we, we as I said, we, I can bring the monkey to the lab and, and, and connect the wires to the implant and, and get the signals, or I can have the, use the wireless device that is, and then this, the monkey's playing in his environment, and I also get the recordings of what the motor cortex is doing. And I said, we've been doing this for two years, and we just didn't have a press conference saying now the monkey can communicate with me because he's not communicating with me. He's going to do what he was going to do. I'm just capturing some of those neural signals and, in, and being able to decode them. So whether it's monkeys or pigs, it, 
that now let's say you're thinking. You say, I'm thinking about a philosopher. Which philosopher I'm thinking of? I mean, what, what do I know? What is a representation of uh, Hegel or Kierkegaard in your mind? I don't know how to extract neural signals that would allow me to do that uh, because I don't. These very higher order cognitive uh, uh, functions are not um, going to be accessible to me unless I know the code. So this is this is really what I do. I I decode. You know, I I said okay. I see these neural signals, and it means move to the right, means move to the left, or going to the letter Q in your keyboard. But now, if you are telling me I'm thinking of a number between one and ten, even that I cannot because I don't know which area of your brain to put my electrode, and I don't know how that abstract thought is represented in your brain. Is it qualitatively different and and therefore inaccessible? Or it's just a question of time. We will decode for movements. Eventually, we'll decode for higher order cognitive processes. I I don't know. I don't know what is the answer to that question. It's a little bit science fiction right now. To, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what about the transmission of information? Would I be able to receive information uh, to the brain and then, for example, just uh, read an article very fast from the internet using those uh, technology? If your data. Star Trek, then you can do that. You just can you receive input from the computer directly. <laughs> Again, I do not know if this is a quantitative difference in the path that we had already started, so that slowly we we'll accumulate more knowledge and we'll get there, or whether some things are qualitatively different in such a way that will remain inaccessible. I I I don't know how to even speculate about that. I don't know. I would say that. But I think, go, going back to um, Elon Musk and, and having him as a hero, it's always very important to have dreamers and to have people who speculate among us. It's always very important to do that. But it's always, always very important to, to put it in context of what we can. I, I, I'm always very careful to say, this is what my model tells me. And then say, now I'm going to speculate because I haven't done that work. It hasn't been proved yet. It hasn't been demonstrated. So, and it's, I think it's very important as scientists to always make that distinction, you know, when we speak. This is the part that I know how it works, and this is the part that I have some intuition how it works, but it's just an intuition, and this is the part that I have no idea how it works or whether it will work at all, you know. So I think it's an important distinction to make, and because he's not a scientist, he doesn't always make that distinction, and that can be a bit misleading. And it makes the, the scientists very antsy, but maybe that's an overreaction. I have Somebody who's not a scientist catching up to them. <laughs> so. do, do you see a connection between uh, mind and consciousness? Do you think there is ah. something higher in the brain? And do, do you oh. think we, like, there is anything beyond us, um, the soul or the brain, or it's purely uh, mechanical? And as you mentioned, the um, connectum. Of the brain, is there anything yeah. mystical or supernatural there between humans and animals, yeah. for example? Well, humans and animals can communicate, that's very obvious, but that doesn't require a which is another question, another reason for having these very serious ethical concerns about doing research that involves animals, you know, because they are not so different. I mean, when, when you are with the monkeys, the monkeys are like children. I mean, uh, they are. I'll tell you a story about the monkey lab. So there, there were two monkeys called fish and chips. So fish. And, uh, okay. So they always brought fish and then they brought chips to the lab. The fish and then chips. And then one day, the, one of the guys was sick. So first they brought chips and then they brought fish. And when they brought fish to the lab, fish was, you know, terribly agitated and fish didn't want to work and fish didn't want to do any of the tasks and it was a completely wasted session and the next time again they, they did the chip and fish and fish again was just going crazy and they couldn't figure out what it was so they called the veterinarians and they said chips is a female monkey and she is right now ovulating and she's emitting all these pheromones so you bring her first she is on the seat it doesn't matter that you clean on anything if you bring chips first by the time you bring fish into the lab he goes bananas 
because this female has been there and he's perceived. So it's like having a house full of teenagers or something like that, you know, dealing with these monkeys. They have their hormonal problems and they like to work with person A. But for instance, they like to work with specific people. You know, sometimes you have a person training a monkey and it doesn't work, and then another person comes in and then it works with that monkey. So they establish affinities, they establish relationships. If they want to work with this person, they don't want to work with somebody else. It's, um, we certainly communicate with animals, certainly, you know, it's, um, we know that. And um, now, is there a physical substrate to all this, or is there something that is beyond the physical substrate? Well, there is nothing that we can measure, right? If your brain is emitting waves that are supposed to reach mine, there is no wave meter that I can put uh, 10 centimeters away from your brain that can detect those waves. So what are those waves in nature? They are completely different from any other physical waves that we have ever measured. I mean, so I, I don't know what they are. We have a collective consciousness because we have a collective culture. But, uh, I, I mean, even at the level of a single individual, is, your, is our consciousness metaphysical or is it just physical? So is yeah. our consciousness just because of all the neurotransmitters going around and all the sodium atom ions going around, or is it something that has, uh, that transcends the, the meat in the brain? You know? mm -hmm. So if you, if you read science fiction, it's always very interesting. There is always a species that meets us and says, what? They think with this piece of meat, it's because, you know, they are all silicon-based intelligences and things like that. And so they look at the brain and it's a piece of meat. How can you be thinking with that? You know, so how can all you that you think and can be emerging from this piece of meat? So it makes you think that maybe there is something else, but it's it's a question of faith, I believe. There is nothing that that uh, indicates to us that this is the case. You know, I, I'm trained as a physicist, so I'm very, uh, in some sense, materialistic about the world. I believe that the world is there, and it is what it is. And what we're trying to do is probe it and understand it. But I, I don't believe that its existence depends on us. You know, when people say, if the tree fell in the forest and I didn't hear it, it was, yeah, the sound is a wave and the sound wave exists. It doesn't matter whether you're hearing it or not. I mean, it exists. The planet, if we are extinct tomorrow, the universe will go on doing its thing. I mean, as it is, because there are all these physical laws that don't depend on us. But now when you ask about our thoughts and our consciousness, I don't know what to say. I don't know what well, to say. It's, it's a bit like that. asking, is there something that is beyond the material substrate? But as a scientist, I don't know how to address that question or how to answer that question. I, I, my thoughts on that are as valid as the thoughts of, uh, of uh, I don't know. That, that's interesting. Oh, you, you, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, you want to finish? I mean, anybody's opinion on this are as valid as mine because the science doesn't guide me to answer this question. Andrew. I, I, okay. I have a theory about it, which uh, I, I would like, I could share uh, real quick. My, my theory was that consciousness is nothing but uh, an exchange of information between your neurons and our thoughts and consciousness or the self-awareness is nothing but uh, our neurons being aware of transmission, of transmission of information from other neurons. So while you're transmitting information, you the other the neighboring neurons or maybe some coupling neurons are aware of this transmission of information. Then you get a sense of consciousness of me thinking. So you kind of experience the world and you experience yourself experiencing the world. Exactly. So to touch upon your question, I, I think there is nothing beyond death. It's just over. So um, it might a... be very pessimistic and non-religious uh, ideology, but that's my interpretation. I would tend uh, bar to, to your point of view because, as I said, I'm because of my training, I'm very materialistic. So I, I believe materialistic in the sense that this is material based to things. Um, so if forced, I would be more aligned with your opinion than with others. But this is really just an opinion. And what I wanted to say is that not because I'm a scientist, my opinion is better than anybody else's opinion. You know, my neighbor who's not a scientist has as valid an opinion on this as mine. Science doesn't illuminate this question, really. 
So and what you I was were trying to say something. Yeah, is um, you mentioned Star Trek. Okay, Star Trek is still a thing, actually. I'm gonna bring up Star Wars. Okay, because that's, that's okay. What I like. Okay, so in Star Wars, uh, actually, there was a quote from Rogue One, which is one of those standalone films that came out recently, where uh, Chirrut, who is uh, one of the main characters in the party that's doing this mission uh, for the Rebels, he says, um, I am one with the Force, and the Force is with me. I am one with the Force, and the Force is with me. He repeats that throughout the movie, and until the moment that he dies in the movie, uh, at the end, it's a very sad moment. But Oops, when he I dies, was... his friend... His friend Baze uh, goes over to him and, and starts, you know, uh, you know, basically weeping and, 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 you know, just grieving for his loss. And he says, and, and Shirt says, um, you know, I'm one with the Force, the Force is with me. Look to the Force and you will always find me. So, you know, I would say in that sense that even when people, you know, when they pass away, there's still something of them left, right? That this, this universe that we live in is, is sort of, sort of, sort of, in some sense, persevering yes. right through time, and so you could ask the question of what, in that sense, really changed, right? It's sort of our perception of what is there is what changed. It's not the actual thing in and of itself, and so that leads me to my own radical philosophy, of course, because I have lots of things. <laughs> and consciousness is actually an illusion, right? And maybe this is compatible with what Barr said because uh, because and it's basically, totally possible. It's, it's totally like, possible, Andrew. It's like living on the surface of the earth and thinking it's flat. You think that exactly. because you're in, the, you're in the midst of it. The, allu the illusion is created by your own, like the like illusion of consciousness is created by this emergent phenomenon, but which you are experiencing because like you are basically experiencing your consciousness. And so of course you will think that that is a reality and you're biologically programmed to do so because it benefits your chance of survival if you don't believe that you are a self-governing agent you will not be able you will have less of efficacy in, in surviving that's that's kind of my thought on it yeah. and and so which I brings us back to, which i don't believe in which brings us back to another to another science fiction classic the matrix right so it's mm -hmm. i mean is it are you really experiencing this or are you experiencing that you are experiencing without actually experiencing it because it's all like a virtual reality kind of thing so mm -hmm. no it's, it's it's totally plausible and i you know i i have struggled with this as i said because when you lose people who are close to you you would like to believe that they are with the force and that the force is with them and because the force is with me also somehow we are connected through the force you you so strongly want to believe that i personally can't but i can't but it's totally compatible this is why it's not a scientific discussion because it's your hypothesis and Barra's hypothesis are equally compatible with, with what you can interpret it one way or you can interpret it the other way and none of us can disprove the other uh, yeah. hypothesis of, because they are of, both compatible with reality as we know it so it's um in terms of scientific methodology though i would say though that the the basically what is left to supernatural uh, phenomena is well okay no i won't say that either but what i will say is the necessity of supernatural phenomena needed to explain something is limit is is given by the limit of what physical phenomena can explain and no, so it's limited, can... no no it's limited by our knowledge of physical phenomena because remember that there was a time not too long ago where our ancestors believed that lightning in the sky was a message from the gods that were disapproving from something because they didn't know what caused it so our attribution of of of, of events or or it, yeah, events in the real world to supernatural causes is it's very often I would I don't want to say always, but I would say substantially a reflection of our ignorance. So right. maybe I don't I believe maybe I don't believe in the force because I haven't seen it and, and it's just a reflection of my ignorance, or maybe I want to believe in the force because it explains things that otherwise I cannot explain based on my current ignorance we have you know accumulating knowledge about the world is in my mind the most the most exciting human adventure is is, is really the human adventure is what distinguishes us from other species that we accumulate knowledge and we pass it on generation to generation because we have language and we have books and we retrain the new generations and so accumulating knowledge is a 
it's a fantastic uh, tool for, for understanding the world. But in spite of all the knowledge that we have accumulated, what we don't know is vast larger than what we know um, about the universe, about ourselves, about the brain, about consciousness. So then we speculate, and then we speculate according to whatever is uh, is, uh, is here for us, given our temperament. Our it, 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 look, there is an existential anxiety, and whatever deals better with your existential anxiety is what works for you. And so, what works for you is not necessarily what works for Bar. You know, it's uh, you you find a path to to dealing with these unknowns that is more. Consistent with the other aspects of your psychology and your personality, and what is what at the end of the day is what comforts you, you know, because we live in this. Um, what am I here for? What am I supposed to do with my life? It's a lot of existential anguish, really, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. So we need comforting thoughts, and whether the comforting thoughts are, I'm alone in the universe, so because it's a deterministic universe, nobody's out to get me. Or I am actually part of a benevolent force. What if you were part of a malevolent force? I would be very scared. I mean, you know, so, so you have to believe that your force is, is benevolent if you want to believe in the force and, and be comforted by it. So I don't know. These are very interesting speculations, but we just have to remember that they are speculations, really. And we have to remember that our scientific knowledge at this point doesn't help us. It's not enough to, to delve into it. Yeah. Or you can go even further than maybe I'm comfortable going at this point, but I'm actually thinking about this idea. That reality is just basically a mental construct. That and is just how you throw everything progress. out, just, you know. That's how you make progress, Andrew, by moving into the realms that you're uncomfortable. If you stay within what you're already comfortable, then it's a bit of a stasis. So I'm all for it, moving to what you're uncomfortable with. So. Cool. All right. Hey, you guys are are a few, but very good. So <laughs> it, it's really it's really cute to talk to you guys. Very good. It, I it's very good to get started, like you're starting now. And I'm sorry that you're not doing it in easier circumstances. All right. Thank you. I I don't. I'm not a master here. It's the students who decide everything. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Thanks for your wonderful sure. lecture.